Well, in the year 33 BC, the two most powerful men in the Roman Republic were Gaius Octavius and Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony was married to Octavius' sister, but he was having an affair with the queen of Egypt, Cleopatra. When Octavian found out about the affair, a series of events unfolded that led to a civil war in Rome. Octavian was victorious, given the name Augustus by the Roman Senate in 27 BC, and that became the first emperor of Rome. Eventually, he called a census that brought Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem, fulfilling a 600-year-old prophecy in the Hebrew Scriptures. Anthony and Cleopatra were defeated, pursued by Octavian to Alexandria until they both finally committed suicide in shame and defeat. History is full of stories of betrayal, revenge, deceit, and war. But at the heart, they are all stories about the brokenness of humanity. How many wars have been started because of the brokenness of two individuals that spirals out of control? How many lives have been lost because of violence that erupts from a shattered heart, from a broken relationship, from a failure of the human conscience? How many races have been subject to the atrocity of ethnic cleansing because of hate within the spirit of another? The history of the world is the history of human brokenness. Now, what on earth does that have to do with sexuality, grace, and truth? Well, it has everything to do with it. Because one of the things I appreciate most about Brian and Exodus is, is that they don't treat sexuality as a special case, as something outside of the usual problems that we have as human beings. Despite the fact that we want to shut it in the closet, they understand that sexual brokenness is really just human brokenness. And we are all broken in some way. That works itself out in many different manifestations of which sexual sin is one. So the answer to sexual sin is not to address merely the sexual element, but to address the element of brokenness in the human heart and in the human spirit. And in doing that, we can address the specific area of sexuality, an area that we often hide from or shy away from because it's, it's uncomfortable. Brian made the point to us yesterday that we need to address issues of sexuality from the pulpit, not just in a conference, not just in a seminar, not just in a classroom, because dealing with these issues from the pulpit demonstrates our recognition of the scope and magnitude of what this is about. Despite the fact that it's one of many issues of brokenness, sexual brokenness is nearly ubiquitous in our current culture. And failing to address the issues of sexuality in our most important and central ministry, which is the ministry of our morning service, if we fail to address the issues here, we are in effect saying, well, this is important, but it's not really that important. We'd rather you deal with that on your own. We'd rather you deal with it in a class. Let's not bring it in, bring it in here. If we do that, we will be ignoring the overwhelming statistics that tell us just how real and, pre and prevalent sexual brokenness is in our population. That more than one in five of you sitting in this room today have a family member or extended family member that identifies with the LGBT community. That one half of our marriages are headed toward dysfunction at some point, even divorce, if something doesn't happen to change. That 90% of your sons and 80% of your daughters will view pornography while they are still in high school. And the growing reality is that our schools and our government are being driven by an agenda that wants to communicate a sexual agenda, not just a sexual curriculum, but a sexual agenda. 
and a worldview to children that is in direct opposition to God's plan. Now, speaking to that issue as Christians presents us with both a danger and a challenge. The danger is hurting those who we actually want to help. Robert Gangan describes this in his book, The Bible and Homosexual Practice. In his introduction, he says these incisive words, talking about the dangers of speaking to this issue. Perhaps worst of all is the knowledge that a rigorous critique of same-sex intercourse can have the unintended effect of bringing personal pain to homosexuals. This is why it needs to be emphatically stated that to feel homosexual impulses does not make one a bad person, I would add parenthetically, in comparison to anybody else. I deplore attempts, says Gagnon, to demean the humanity of homosexuals. The person beset with homosexual temptation should evoke our concern, sympathy, help, and understanding, not scorn or enmity. Brian just said that a couple of minutes ago. Even more, such a person should kindle a feeling of solidarity in the heart of all Christians, since we all struggle to properly manage our erotic passions. There is a danger that when we speak about God's, God's thoughts on this issue, we will hurt. So we have to defend against that danger. How? How? 100% grace and 100% truth. The challenge is we are being attacked and we are having definitions changed upon us even as we try to respond, sometimes with as much grace and truth as we can. One of the outworkings of the distortion of the concept of gender and sexual purity is that is that the very definitions are being altered. You see what I'm saying? The very concept of gender is being distorted and altered and maybe even ignored in some cases. This is not new. This happened with the family in what is now years ago when we began to redefine what marriage means. We began to reevaluate re what a nuclear family means. We don't even use the word nuclear family anymore because it doesn't have really any meaning in our culture. It's archaic. It's, an it's an anachronism. It's from the ancient world to talk about a nuclear family. But what I'm suggesting to you is that our world is continuing to redefine words in order to advance a sexual agenda. This is hard to combat. Because when you change what words mean, it's really hard to enter into any sort of, of conversation about things. Consider for, with me for just a moment the way that proponents of the homosexual agenda have proceeded to label those who would challenge that position. It started out as being intolerant. Intoler it's intolerant to speak against this issue. It then escalated to being homophobic, which is a psychological term, even a medical term, that was created for philosophical use. What I mean is that a phobia, if you look in a psychological textbook, it will tell you it's a clinical anxiety disorder or an irrational or disproportionate fear of someone or something. So what happens is simply by creating a word for someone who challenges that particular position, you have defined those people as mentally ill. How much of a step is it then to dismiss their argument as simply being invalid. They're not just intolerant, they're ridiculous, they're even crazy. Now we have the category of hate speech, which is a legal term. So we've created a legal definition to say that if you mount a challenge, it doesn't matter what the content of, argument, of your argument is, you're violating the law. This has the absurd consequence that in some places, if you quote the Bible in public, you could be breaking the law because it's hate speech. That's a difficult battle to fight, let alone have any chance of winning. But this is happening because the foundational assumptions of our current cultural situation 
are setting the stage for this to be able to happen. The foundational assumptions that we deal with every day, that, we, that our kids deal with in the classroom, that we deal with in the workplace and in the public sphere, are being challenged, changed, eroded, or even lost. So this morning, I just want to take a really quick look at God, gender, and the gospel. In light of our conference this weekend that I'm so happy we had so many come out to yesterday, it was such a great great day. And if you didn't make it, we're not finished with this, with this issue. We want to keep providing resources and, and, and help for believers to be able to engage in, in this conversation. But I want to point out to you this morning, from the pulpit, addressing the issue of sexuality, addressing the issues of God, gender, and the gospel, four foundational assumptions of our world that are false according to God's word, yet are treated as true, and just they're, they're not even discussed because we assume them. The reason I want to do that is because this helps us to think clearly about how we need to respond as Christians to these issues. It prepares us. Understanding the assumptions that are coming at us prepares us for being able to mount a challenge. If we're going to be able to do that with grace and with truth, we need to have an understanding of what it is we're talking about. So we can avoid ending up in a confrontation because we start with different assumptions. So four truisms of modern culture that run contrary to God's original design. Before we get to them, why don't we look at what God's original design for gender is? That's found, guess where, in the book of Genesis. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. I want to just handle two verses. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 this morning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. This is God's word. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The first thing that the world says is that no one can tell you what truth is for you. No one can tell you what truth is for you. You probably come up against this before, right? Maybe even when you're sharing the gospel. Someone might say, well, that might be true for you, but it's not true for me. This is the claim that there's no such thing as absolute truth. There's no such thing as uh, right or wrong, objective morality. These concepts are all relative and circumstantial. In fact, it's oppressive for you to impose your view of right and wrong on someone else. This is a cultural assumption that we live with today. People probably won't say that anymore, but they all believe it. Or many of us believe it. And when I'm in a conversation with with a young person about uh, sexuality and behavior, I almost always start here. Because if you're going to make a case that such and such a behavior is wrong, you have to first establish that there is such a thing as right and wrong. Leave aside the issue of whether homosexuality is genetically determined. It's not, by the way. But forget about that for a minute. Leave aside whether the issue of premarital sex and cohabitation is beneficial to a future marriage. Testing out compatibility. It's not. It's not beneficial to that. There is no evidence to support that claim. But forget about that just for a minute. Start with the question of can anything rightly be described as right or wrong? Or is there anything at all that's not okay to do? If there isn't, why proceed? (laughs) If there is even hypothetically, then the next thing is to show why something in particular falls into either the right or the wrong area. Some things we'll have a harder time putting into one of those boxes than others. But if we can agree in principle that there are some things that belong over here and something that belong over over here, at least we have a starting point for discussion. You see, the problem with the assumption that there is no absolute truth is that this is a truth claim itself. So that, quest, that, that statement implodes upon itself. Because if it were true, it would invalidate itself. So there must be some things that are just true, necessarily. But who defines that? 
You? Me? The Prime Minister? The culture? The United Nations? Genesis 1.26 says, God said. The whole of this chapter is describing the same repetitive act. God said. And it was so. You see, we can't determine our own truth. We need something outside of ourselves to determine it for us. The finite, that is us, requires the infinite in order to specify what its boundaries are. You can't specify boundaries from within the finite circle. All laws require a law giver. That giver is God. We need something outside of ourselves. That something is God. And there are moral laws that are common to all societies. There are physical laws that are common to all matter. Law does not exist without something to give it. That someone is God. God said, and it was so. God creates, and in so doing, he defines his creation. He makes the rules because he exists outside of his creation. You may try to bend them. You may try to break them. You may even call the rules by a different name, but you can't change them. Now, gender, it seems to me, is a biological rule created by God because he spoke, and it was so. That seems to be what what Genesis 1 is telling us. The world wants to tell us that there is no such thing. You are arrogant if you try and say, well, this is the way things are. In fact, it's a very arrogant claim to say that there is no such thing as any absolute standard in any sphere. That's a really hard position to hold. But we don't tend to challenge that very often because it's an assumption. It kind of goes without saying. Genesis 1 says, hold on a minute, back up the tape a minute. We need to challenge that if we're going to have any meaningful dialogue. The second thing the world says is you can be anything you want to be. You can be anything you want to be. Now, I've heard that before. You probably have too. You may have even said that. I know I've said that sometimes. Why do we say that? Sometimes we're trying to encourage our kids. Hey, you can be anything you want to be. Go for it and go get it. The problem with that is that that's not true. You can't be anything you want to be. You can't do anything you want to do. I was just reading this morning about a city in the UK, Brighton, that sent home a letter to its parents in the first day of school, or prior to the first day of, of school, asking them to identify and choose what the gender of their children is before they send them to school, so that they can uh, interact with them on the basis of that gender. The letter said, please support your child to choose the gender they identify with the most. And there are multiple choices, not not just two. That kind of thing is happening increasingly because we have the underlying assumption that you can be anything you want to be. Now, as Christian parents, we should be encouraging our children. We should be teaching them that they can shoot for the stars. But what we want to say is not you can be anything you want to be. We want to say you can be whatever God wants you to be. You can reach the full potential that God has planted in your heart and in your life if you follow him and if you honor him and if you seek him and if you seek his wisdom in your choices. You can be the best, the best you that God made you to be. I think maybe we need to be a little more intentional when we say those kinds of things because we can convey, we can convey an an unconscious assumption That will lead to people giving them a multiple choice form as to what gender they want to be. That's going to be, that's going to turn out to be a problem. See, if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make man. God said, let us make. See, it's God who creates. He defines what we are by virtue of the fact that he made us. So he knows what we are. Not just making anything. Not just making a few blades of grass. 
The Bible teaches us that we are the crowning achievement of God's creation. The Bible tells us that we are the apple of his eye. The Bible tells us that we are special and unique, each one. That not only does he know what you are and what you are made of, but he knows every hair upon your head, how many there are, and when they're going to turn gray and when they're going to fall out. You want to know, don't you? <laughs> but God defines us because he made us. The assumption that you can be anything you want to be is just not true. Just like the assumption that, that everything is relative and there's no absolutes in all the universe. It's not true. We need to know that and just keep that in mind as we're as we're foraging ahead, forging out into this world where there's so many conflicting ideas. The third thing the world says is that all roads lead to salvation. All roads lead to salvation. You've heard this for sure, right? This is religious pluralism. This is more than just religious pluralism, but we hear it when, with respect to religion all the time. Well, all religions basically teach the same thing, don't they? They all talk about love and goodness and forgiveness and, and redemption and reaching your potential. That's not really true. All religions don't teach the same thing. You can say that as many times as you want, but it's not the case. You just have to study one in order, in order to understand that. But the bigger problem is that we have moved from a world where God, if he exists at all, is separate or different from his creation to a world where God is the same as his creation. How does that manifest itself in all roads leading to him? Well, Peter Jones in his book, The Other World View, describes this distinction as one-ism versus two-ism. Two-ism is the view that there is God who is distinct and different from creation. One-ism is the view that there is only one thing, only one kind of stuff in existence. God is the same as his creation. What that means is that God is the universe. Meaning is found by being one with the universe, one with nature. The drive behind this is to eliminate all distinctions. The distinction between God and nature, between creator and creation, between man and woman, or even between man and God. If everything is the same, then the universe is self-defining. Man is self-made. Everything you need to succeed is within you. Have you ever heard that? Like every Hollywood movie that comes out, right? We save ourselves because it's within us to do it. This is not esoteric philosophy. This is what we, what we hear every day. This is foundational to the assumptions of our culture. Personal development will ultimately lead you to solve all your own problems. So what happens is... We end up worshiping nature, worshiping the universe, or worshiping ourself. Because it's all one. It's all the same. Does that remind you of anything? How about Romans chapter 1? Romans chapter 1, verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Your translation might say, who is forever praised. When worship is misdirected, it results. What does it result in in Romans 1? It results in impurity. It results in, in the distortion of intended use of the body. And that creates all kinds of problems. The reality is that we are all worshipers. And Genesis 1 hints at this when it says, God created man in his own image. What does it mean to be in the image of God? It means many things. Harold Best characterized worship 
as the finite expression of God's infinite nature to pour himself out in love and relationship to his creation. He suggests that part of what it means to be in the image of God is that we are outpourers in a finite way, the same way as God is an outpourer in an infinite way. God, of course, cannot worship, but he pours himself out. He pours himself out in relationship within the Trinity. He pours himself out in his creative act in the book of Genesis as he, as he, as he speaks and the beauty of creation comes into existence. He pours himself out to the people he created who turned away from him and slapped him in the face and rejected him, yet he pours himself out in a sacrifice so great it cost him his son pours himself out as his image bearers. It's our nature to pour ourselves out, to worship. But the right subject of worship is God. If we don't worship God, we will worship something else. That's just because that's what we are. And whatever it is, that something else will be a distortion and a detraction from the true and living God who is forever praised. The expression of oneism in the world is that all roads lead to salvation because everything is the same. All religions are the same. They basically teach the same thing. But if we accept this assumption, we will end up worshiping ourselves. We will end up worshiping creation. God says, let us create man in our image. He will be a worshiper, and the direction of his worship should be his gracious and loving creator. The world wants to say that there is no absolute truth. You can be whatever you want to be. All roads lead to salvation. The fourth thing the world wants to say is that God's purpose for you is that you are happy. God's purpose for you is that you are happy. I was watching a car commercial the other day. And this is all it said. It showed pictures of a guy in this car. He's, you know, he's driving the car really fast around the, that hairpin turn that they always have in the car commercial. And, and, and they said one thing. The purpose, sorry, the most important thing about any car is the way it makes you feel. The most important thing about any car, well, he said it, he said it in the commercial voice, right, like the James Earl Jones voice. The most important thing about any car is the way it makes you feel. (laughs) I won't tell you what brand of car it was, because everyone will be going out to get that car. It seems hard to argue with the idea that, that happiness should be our primary objective in life, doesn't it? Seems like that seems right. That's an assumption. That we should be justified in seeking happiness and never deterred. Heaven forbid that something should deter us from that pursuit. That is a false assumption. God wants you to be happy. For sure he does. He wants you to be fulfilled. For sure he does. But he wants you to find that fulfillment in him. He didn't create you specifically so that you could be happy. Why did he create you? Did he have a purpose in mind? Look at Genesis chapter 1. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God has created man for himself and to act on his behalf in the world. So then we get to the book of Ecclesiastes and it says, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. You could just as easily say, worship God and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man. And then we read in in, in God's command to the nation of Israel, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And then Paul turns around in Philippians 3 verse 10 and says that I may know him. That's my whole purpose in life, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. God's purpose for you is to know him and in so doing to glorify him. His purpose in creation is to glorify himself. 
That's why we're created as worshipers. So we can turn back to God and say, all glory to you. God's purpose is to reflect his glory on the earth through his creation, through you. So as you rule the earth and subdue it and organize it and take care of it, we don't end up worshiping the earth. We worship God and we do what he's asked us to do, which is take really good care of what he's made. When we do that, we're happy, joyful, fulfilled beyond what we could ever imagine. But when we seek our own happiness, we invariably fail because we're fallen. Our nature is distorted by sin just a few pages ahead. And it causes us to seek our own selfish desires rather than to seek the one who can fulfill all our desires in himself. So, to seek to define my own gender because that's what will make me happy is missing the point of the purpose for which God has designed us. It has nothing to do with sexual orientation, but rather spiritual orientation. I learned that also from Brian. Not sexual orientation. We're not fighting sexual orientation. We're fighting spiritual orientation. Turning to God to be what he intended us to be. Now, sexuality is a part of his purpose for us because part of that charge in Genesis 1 is to be fruitful and multiply. That's in verse 28, the very next verse. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. There it goes, comes back into ruling on his behalf. We can only fulfill the earth by embracing the diversity of sexes there's two-ism, not one-ism. The diversity of sexes and following God's perfect and wonderful design for intimate relationship between a man and a woman. So when God specifies a purpose, we should listen. When God says this is how it should be, we should listen. That's why we listen. When God says a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to a woman and the two will become one flesh. That's why we listen when it's repeated in the Old Testament and the New Testament that it describes that same-sex physical union is contrary to God's intent and design. We need to listen to that. We need to learn from that. That's why we should pay close attention to Paul when he writes in his letters, when he talks about gender roles and how we should behave and function in the church. We need to seek to understand that, to figure out how does that, what does that mean for the church today? We know what maybe it meant for the church in Corinth. What does it mean for, for the church today? We need to take the Bible at its word and say, we better listen when, when it talks about what we should do with our gender. I don't get to set my own purpose. Purpose is defined by God. That's the message of Genesis 1. So, our time is gone. Where do we go from there? From those four assumptions. The assumption that, that there is no such thing as, as true and untrue. That's not, that's not right. The assumption that you can be whatever you want to be. That doesn't work. The, the assumption, the assumption that, that, that all roads lead to salvation. Hmm. No, they don't really. The assumption that your purpose is primarily to be happy and no one should stop you from that. Well, no, that's not going to get you very far. Where do we end up? We end up in verse 27. Verse 27 is the description, the writer's description of what happens after God says, I have this great idea, I'm going to make man. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. He repeats it just for the glory, just for the glory of what that act has done. And then he says, male and female he created them. Isn't it interesting that in the first time the Bible talks about mankind, it talks about gender. It emphasizes the glory of this creation that we, will know, that we know from, from the rest of the scriptures is the apple of God's eye. It's his crowning achievement, you. And then it says, and he created you male and female. See, Ultimately, gender reflects the glory of God. Gender reflects the glory of God because it's part of his purpose in creation. But he specifically wants to tell us that right here. Before we get, before we get any further down the road of talking about, even before he talks about the, the, the role as vice regents on the earth, God specifies the distinction between the sexes. 
It's going to fulfill you if you embrace that. How do we get there? How do we get there? Because we need to get from the pervasive brokenness that we started with, that's so deep in all of us. Don't think that, that's, that that brokenness is happening just in one segment of the population. It's not. We are all experiencing various levels and degrees and kinds of brokenness. How do we get from there to the glorious and wonderful perfection of God's design for us? How do we get from the darkness of frustration and confusion to the light of joy and fulfillment that God wants for us? The answer is the gospel. The gospel takes us there. Jesus takes us there. That is the life that he came to bring. Freedom, change, transformation, and ultimate fulfillment. That's why he said, come, come to me. All you who are weary from carrying heavy burdens, from carrying your brokenness, whatever that looks like, from carrying confusion, from carrying failure, from carrying shame, he didn't say, come to me only if you're heterosexual. He didn't say, come to me, only if you got everything kind of worked out. He didn't say, come to me if you don't have any problems. He said, come first. Let me give you rest and help you get back to God's created design. Jesus says, I will transform your life. Take you from brokenness to fullness of life and relationship with the Father. That's why Paul could turn around and say to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, do you, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified. This is an incredible passage of scripture. We studied this at the pastor seminar a few weeks ago that that we had with Brian uh, and pastors from the area of all churches that wanted to send people to the conference. Let me read this to you in the New Living Translation because some of those words are hard to understand what they mean to us in modern language. I think that the New Living sticks to the meaning but makes it easier to understand. Listen to this. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourself. Don't be confounded by false assumptions. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or who commit adultery, who are male prostitutes, who practice homosexuality, who are thieves, now it's getting a little closer to home, who are drunkards, who are abusive, Have you ever been abusive? Who cheat people? None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that. Some of you were once like that. But, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. That is the hope of life abundant that exists in Christ. The hope for the, for the people in, in the, the church in Corinth is the same hope that we have today. That, does, that, that despite, despite whatever has happened in your life, whatever you have done, if you come to him, he can heal your brokenness. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you are gay, straight, bisexual, or transgender. It doesn't matter whether you're a liar, a cheat, or an adulterer. He will accept you as you are, but he doesn't want you to stay as you are. He wants to change your spiritual orientation, not leave you the way that you are, but bring you back into fellowship with God, into God's perfect design. He wants to transform you into the likeness of of Christ to restore you to God's perfect and original intent 
so you can be a beautiful reflection of his glory. He can do it. He has done it. And he'll do it for you if you come to him. Let's pray. God of grace and glory, God of all our hurts and our brokenness, thank you for the transforming life that comes through Christ. Teach us to know you more, to come with all of our hurts, and seek what only you can give us, rest for our souls. In Jesus' name.